It's your turn. Related to what Gustavo raised and Jill um, affirmed regarding needing to go into schools and asking, what do you need? Um, and I know, as Gustavo mentioned, he's uh, um, grounded in Freire. I guess the question that I have for, for both of them is, is one about um, pedagogical authority and um, whether beginning with the assumption that we should go into schools and say, what do you need, abdicates the pedagogical authority and the, the political projects that we have. Um, on some level, I, we shouldn't be dictating the projects to students and, and to schools. On the other hand, um, we shouldn't be completely abdicating our own political projects and pedagogical authority. I, I think that's Freire's own position, and I'd like to actually hear from Gustavo and, and Jill uh, about that question. Me? Okay. Um, let me make it a, a short story. See if, if this uh, helps. <clears throat> um, when we go to back, or when we go to the schools and we ask, what do you need? Uh, we have a project. And, and, and the project is, let's work together. Uh, let's try to work, identify what's the problem. Um, your problem, my problem, and see what can we do. Uh, it takes different forms. I'm going to connect with uh, Jill's story. Uh, last year I was in Chile. Uh, before the big explosion, in the middle of the big explosion, and big explosion, I'm talking 350,000 people mobilizing the city of Santiago, it really is, it feels like an earthquake there, and that country knows about the earthquakes. Uh, and after, in the three opportunities working with three different universities. And in the middle of the mobilizations, uh, I was teaching at the uh, a technological university in Santiago de Chile that was created by Pinochet, by the dictatorship, to separate the big federal national university. And this is uh, a, a university for anybody that is familiar with uh, the story of Chile, that's the university that uh, Victor Jara, one of the greatest poets and activists of the Chilean uh, you know, socialist movement, uh, was kidnapped and then sent to the football stadium where he was tortured and killed. Uh, so when you enter to this university, the first thing that you see is a wall with the name of the students that were students, faculty, and workers that were you know, tortured, jailed, and killed, and a statue of Victor Jara. So, and, and there, this is uh, the center of, supposedly, it's the center of political activism. The students are all on the streets, demonstrating. Faculty is inside the classrooms. Faculty is not on the streets. I said, in very polite English, I ask, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong here? What's wrong? And what was wrong was this lack of you know, a space to communicate, to dialogue, to confront ideas. The students were not asking for, uh, let's go back to the previous structure. Let's go back to the golden age of the... They were asking for, let's have a different... Universe. And we don't want this university that we have. is bad. 
The one that the faculty imagined that was great in the 70s, we don't have any freaking idea if that's good or bad, or, and we don't want that. We want something new. And in the something new, the faculty were scared. Very, very, very scared. Nominally, they said, well, you know, we, we support the students, but they were not with the students. So sometimes we need to go and, and, and ask humbly without knowing what we are going to contribute. And I think that that is reclaiming our uh, pedagogical authority and saying, OK, there is something that all these years of uh, working, researching, dialoguing, having conflicts and so on, I think I can contribute to, with something. But I'm not sure that I can predict in anticipation of that dialogue what is that thing that I'm going to contribute. But I reclaim my authority that there is something I can do to contribute. And sometimes it's going to be criticized the students for uh, saying, we want something new that is completely new, that we really don't know what that thing new is like. Put it in paper. Tell me what the plans. You know, how are we going to finance? And that's something we can do. We have some expertise in knowing what and anticipating problems. And sometimes it's going to be just to be silent together with them, without telling them what to do. But just to be there, occupying that space with them, I think that that's a pretty important contribution, even if we don't know what to say. It, well, and so, you know, when, again, when I'm thinking about the work part and the job part, in terms of uh, going into schools, for example, you know, in, in Western Wisconsin, um, I have a hearty, hearty critique of what's happening in those classrooms um, because they're pretty scary places. And, and, and my, my own offspring are, are students of color, and I know what they've gone through in these schools. And I know what I'd like to do in those schools with our, my colleagues that are the teachers. But they're coming out of their own context, and they don't understand my critique. To them, they can't even see that there's a problem. So part of what my comments are about that is, is, is to, like, that is part of that humility. That's how you build a dialogue. Because, uh, you know, stepping in and saying, this is how it needs to be. This is what you're doing. You're hurting these children. Look at this, uh, you know, look at the data. You're being uh, held accountable by the state for this, you know, marginalization of these huge populations of kids. Um, I'm not going to get anywhere in that. So I think part of, of entering that space uh, and creating a dialogue with those colleagues, it's not seeding my critique or my vision or whatever. I may be, uh, I mean, that's the only entrance that you have, I think, um, is, is to create that space for dialogue. In, in terms of Chile, I mean, I'll just echo what Gustavo was saying um, since I was there at the same time, even though I was in Valparaiso. And uh, same thing, I mean, you know, there were, there were hundreds of thousands of students on the street every day. And, and these were students I had been working with for the last three years. So I actually well, was uh, really fortunate to have been invited to have some workshops with them. And, uh, and it was really interesting because a lot of the time, you know, when I share my research here in the United States and at AERA, usually the response is, wow, oh, that is so powerful. We can really use that because, you know, we've been <laughs> kind of saying, OK, this is a failed model. And I said, no, it's a very successful model. But it's a failed, it's going to fail. I mean, it is a failed outcome, not based on education, um, based on profits. But the idea that the, the, the Chilean experience is so powerful and can so impact our critique here, because it is evidence of why this model will fail. Because we have 40 years of data on exactly what's going to happen. And as it's happened in Chile, it's happening here. Exactly. I mean, almost. And it's so interesting because I always tell my students here, you know, in Chile, they had a dictatorship, put it into place, you had no choice. Here we're like, ooh, yeah, accountability. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, let's try to local control. Yeah, let's do this. And uh, it's just, you know, so for me, that's one of the big questions is ideologically, and I think it does have to do with this whole kind of libertarian, you know, bend to our critique in, in the United States, at least, that uh, how do we buy this? junk, you know. Um, but my question has always been, what does this have to, how does this work 
which I'm learning from my colleagues and Shirley, how does this help them? They know what they're living. They know that they're losing out on their year. They know, you know, what, what you know. so a lot of the work that I've done with them too is like, how is this useful to you, you know, to try to figure out, right? And, and it is true, you know, half of the time it's, it's just under, you know, letting them um, understand that there are these conversations going on outside of the country. Um, even for them to understand that their story is really important for everyone else, that they are the first ones that are going through this, that what the students build, whatever that might be, and, and I have you know my own critique of, of where they're going with this, but in a sense it's like, well, who do I think I am? They're living it every single day. So whatever they build is something that we're all gonna learn from. And, and I think for them to, to recognize how important that is to us is also something that kind of de that, that legitimizes their struggle. Um, so it's sort of like, and I think probably I went away from Ken's comment, but this idea of if, if you don't enter with this, this, the possibility that really you have nothing to contribute, then you may end up just alienating that com that possible conversation and 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 not being able to build those relationships. I know Peter wanted to say something. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, but I just had I just wanted to piggyback on that a bit because I think it it relates to an aspect of of Ken's question. Um, the danger of you know teachers going in and and somehow bringing their agenda in, into high schools. This is, a, I think, a, another example that I think is quite, um, quite interesting. A few years back, I was asked to, to go and visit a high school in Medellin, Colombia. And I was there to work with, um, do some work with one of the teachers' unions. And the head of the teachers' union um, told me that Every head of the teachers' union in the entire existence of this teachers' union has been assassinated. So he knew that his time was, was you know, he knew that this was going to happen to him. Um, last I heard, it hasn't, but uh, it very likely may. Um, and I remember um, giving some talks, I think I was giving some talks at the university, and some high school teachers came up to to me and said, hey, will you come and visit our school? Um, we'd really love to have you as our guest. And, and I said, oh, sure. So um, I was invited to go one afternoon. And the school was named La Independencia. And um, so the teachers met with me in a, uh, in a large room like this. And they said, We'd like to ask you some questions because a lot of your work is translated into Spanish, but not a lot of your recent work. It takes years before we can read what your recent thinking is all about. So now we can get it, have an opportunity to ask you what, what your thoughts are. And so I said, OK. And um, I launched into a whole uh, discourse about critical pedagogy needs to be a social movement. And it needs to be a social movement for the struggle for socialism. And uh, and that and you can in, in socialism needs to be reconceived outside of the Eurocentric, you know, socialism of the of Europe, uh, and we need to look at indigenous um, social formations as a way of reimagining what socialism can be. And I was using a very high, highly politicized language to talk about critical pedagogy, and they were looking at me, and some people were writing notes, and some people were kind of looking at each other, and some people were shaking their heads. And I was talking about, you know, that everything you do has to be connected to the revolution, the larger struggle, uh, uh, anti-capitalist struggle. So after my talk, uh, one of the teachers stood up and said, "We really like your work, Peter, and and we we've been, you know, using it in our in our own formation as as as, as educators. But if we even attempted to." use some of the language you've been using right now, we'd be killed. We've got something we'd like to show you. And so they had a computer uh, with a slide show uh, prepared for me. 
and uh, one of them went out and pushed the button, and I was looking at images. And one of the images was of young students, uh, high school age students, holding up white sheets. Uh, images of, 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 of blood on sidewalks. Um, very disturbing images. Um, and they said, Peter, if we use the language of your critical pedagogy, uh, this is what would happen to us. And I said, well, what's going on? What's, what's this slideshow all about? What, what's happening here? And they said, well, a few years back, we had a visit from the state into our community in the form of helicopter, tank, artillery, 2,000 troops. And when they left our community, then the paramilitary came. That was even worse. They dragged people out of their homes by their hair and shot them in the head, their doorsteps. And they said, so we have a different approach than you do, Peter. Um, we have a ped critical pedagogy of healing. And they talked to me a little bit about mi español es muy malo. I mean, I have still some problems with the Spanish, but I usually have folks there that can help me um, grasp what's being said and, and they were trying to explain to me what the pedagogy of healing was all about and they said look we take a position of neutrality we've been at war we've had a civil war going on for 40 years between the government and the gorilla the FARC right in the countryside and we take an official position of neutrality we do not let any pro FARC spokespersons come into our school and propagandize we don't let any paramilitary come in and propagandize in our school. If the state wants to come, we can't stop them. We don't have tanks, we don't have helicopter, we don't have artillery, we don't have guns. So um, I, I, I was looking a little bit stunned and I realized that here I was advocating a particular form of critical pedagogy without really even understanding the context in which I was speaking. I'd just been you know, adventitiously invited to this to this to this school, and uh, I really didn't understand the history of the neighborhood, the history of of um, of the school, and so um, I said, "Well, how is your critical pedagogy of healing? You know, healing healing lives, repairing sort of the damage uh, that's been done to the young people um, uh, throughout the daily course of their lives." I said, "How how." how has your critical pedagogy of healing worked? And they said, well, uh, before, before we really got our program together, 90% of our students wanted to, after they graduated from high school, wanted to go into the military or paramilitary. Now, 95%, something like this, 95% want to go to university. And so they said, so I, 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 I bid them for well, I, we, we, we hugged, and uh, they said, um, would, you, would you speak about us today? You're giving a big talk in the public library in Medellin. Would you mention us in your talk? I said, absolutely mention you. So uh, during my talk about critical pedagogy, I told a, a little bit about my visit to La Independencia. And uh, after my talk, some of my ultra leftist friends uh, came up to me afterwards and they said, how would you support a school that has an, an official position of neutrality? Paulo Freire says to remain neutral in, in, a, in, 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 in a situation of unequal power relationships, you are actually supporting you know, the victimizer. And um, I was kind of shocked by that position and uh, I had to explain um, you know, what it means, what, what the particular politics of neutrality meant and the consequences it meant to take that position and the necessity of taking that position to save lives. So um, that was an interesting discussion, very interesting discussion. Um, Jesus, Peter, what a, uh, what a powerful story of uh, context. I, I really liked um, Ken's question uh, to start off this current round. Because for me, I, I'm, I'm kind of the kind of person that really wants to know, like, well, what's the project and what am I going to get involved in? So I like how you pose that to, to, to Jill and Gustavo. And I guess um, and it's kind of like a, what, a 16 year class reunion because Peter was also the co chair of my committee. So it's kind of like a spa <laughs> reunion. But, um, but I remember, Peter, when you, when you first came to interview at UCLA from Ohio, 
and I remember it was a talk with grad students, and uh, I remember you said that uh, critical pedagogy is a pedagogy without guarantees, right? So you, you pose this to students, or you go to the schools, right? What do you want to talk about? What's what's going on, right? And, and I, I don't know if you use this example, or in years <coughs> after that, if I've used this example, but we want to talk about how our involvement in Afghanistan is great, right? And you're like, oh, that's not where I was hoping this would go, right? But uh, so the students can bring anything up, but I guess, you know, if we're in the project of critical pedagogy, any of us, um, or in, in the project of social justice, uh, whatever's brought up, we are going to bring, I suppose, our criticality to those conversations, right? So even if students might bring up something that, I mean, it'd be great in the States, you know, but certainly in Chile where if we're engaging with people that are already kind of activists, like the students on strike and whatnot, it was right there. But if, even if we're not, if we're engaging in U.S. schools that are buying into some of the neoliberalism, you know, you know, we can just sort of assist in facilitating to problematize whatever's being talked about, right? And just kind of see where that goes, I guess. That's that's how I was thinking about this topic. But I, I think it's I think it's really important, you know. And and, and Ken's right. That's you know, didn't Freddie said that you know we're authorities shouldn't be authoritarian, but we're authorities, and we've got some stuff to bring, but how do you bring that in a non, you know, sort of, you know, interventionist way? It's a great question. Uh, I just have a brief comment uh, about Ken's question. I just like kind of a little light bulb went off when you were talking about teachers and, and you know, how the teachers really, um, aren't aware of sort of their own oppression. It's almost Freire in, in the dialectic that Freire talks about the pedagogy of the oppressed having two sides, that um, you know we are oppressed, but we are at the same time the oppressor. And you know I'm dealing with that myself in, in it, you know being a teacher educator, um, teachers are, are you know they come in, they're really fresh, they're, they're committed. Um, they really want to get into lockstep and, and um, reproduce what's there. They want to just add one spin and, and reproduce it sort of better. And sort of these big sort of um, publishing houses and the biggest one that we're dealing with right now is the TPA or TPAC from Stanford University that um, in Massachusetts, all five University of Massachusetts have, have adopted this new assessment system. Um, they gave a lot of money to the universities. The universities adopted it without even asking the Department of Education whether or not they wanted to do this or not. It involves um, uh, the, all the student teachers collecting, it's like, an, it's like a, a big NK project for the whole entire United States. They're collecting data on each and every student along with a video of their teaching because they want to sort of universalize what teacher education is going to look like across the country. Um, I think it's very dangerous. There's a couple of people at UMass that are questioning um, privacy rights of the students. Nobody asked the students for permission to use their work and their videos. There's really no uh, sort of um, you know, confidentiality uh, involved or anything. So, but the, te the teachers that, you know, some teacher educators and some of the teachers are really buying into this because it's Stanford University, they must know. Um, I, just, I just think, it just made me think of that dialectic of Freire talking about, you know, this pedagogy of the oppressed is, you know, multifaceted, but also this dialectic that, you know, um, the teacher's not even being aware that they're being oppressed and at the same time reproducing sort of this model of whatever we're saying is the model of teacher education, the best model, they're then sort of becoming the oppressors in, in, in uh, buying into this model. So I just thought that might be a little bit of a response to what you were asking in terms of career. Um, um, I'd, I'd just like to say something. That's great. I have a slightly different um, perspective on this. I think. Um, I've been teaching teachers, uh, actually uh, graduate classes, so you know people who are already teaching in the profession, so not not undergrads that are sort of going fresh right. into the um, into the position, and also doing research in public schools on uh, Chicago's South Side, and um, I think one of the things that about neoliberalism and the way it reproduces itself, and this is something that um, can is getting out a little bit in his discussion of market Stalinism and the new uh, market bureaucracy, is that it reproduces itself through cynicism. 
and, and I want to get to Peter's point about violence too, because it also reproduces itself through violence. So I think a lot of our conversation right now is focused on um, how it depoliticizes and people, uh, you know, it, it produces sort of um, a lack of criticality, yeah. Yeah, a lack that's of critical right. consciousness. Okay. But I found with p teachers who are actually in the profession, at least in the Chicago area, there's a great deal of critical consciousness around testing. Right. around standardization no, of right. curriculum, right. around having their autonomy taken from them, um, about deprofessionalization. I found that teachers, even really reactionary conservative <laughs> teachers who may um, have, you, you know, reproduce all kinds of neoconservative discourses about the welfare state and so on and so forth, um, they, they still are almost universally critical of these practices. But the problem is, is that you know, liberalism reproduces itself a great deal through cynicism. And this is something that Slava Zizek talks about right. in terms of people doing things that they don't actually believe. And when you, when you think about testing or you think about zero tolerance policies in schools, I mean, who actually believes? I, and I know they're out there, but who actually believes that reducing learning to a test score or some number is actually something that we might call education? Or for that matter, who actually believes, who actually believes they're arresting kids um, in their schools and, and bringing in paramilitary um, stormtroopers to patrol school hallways, that that's actually um, you know, socially beneficial in any kind of way. So, but, but that cynicism is always backed up through violence. So you know, people, you know, people doing things that they, that they don't actually believe in, there's also a sense, well, this is just the ruling order. There is no alternative. We can't do anything about it. That's one, and that's one sense of things. But on the other sense of things, it's just routinized violence. I mean, teachers um, at the school that I was doing research at, um, they're experimenting with new surveillance systems and computer systems where all um, their, their grading and everything else is accessible um, at, at the State Board of Education you know, headquarters in downtown Chicago. So administrators can actually look into their grade books, look at the numbers, see if they're um, following protocols, you know, off-site. Administrators patrol the hallways and make sure teachers are following through on implementing these scripted programs that are contra con contracted out to corporations. And if they're not following through those things, they're reprimanded. Um, so, I just I think that those are two those are two things. I, I, no, it's I found a, good a great point. deal. Point I found a great deal of critical consciousness among the teachers, yeah. but the recourse to actually uh, resisting is 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 really hollowed out of those spaces. For yeah. I, I, I want to make a point. I'm sorry. <laughs>